Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, sorry, just a hiccup there and just starting this off. Hope you all will hear me uh, and welcome uh, to this virtual conference. I'm doing a live stream now. So um, what I'm going to be doing is taking you through a couple of strategic aspects. One is uh, COVID-19. I know you've been working very hard on COVID-19 and making your schools safe. Not an easy thing at all and probably have day-to-day -day tasks around that. It's really difficult. Um, and I want to talk particularly about the heating and ventilating aspects and giving a little bit more understanding around that and perhaps some of the impacts of that on your energy costs. Uh, secondly, I'd like to look at carbon legislation, a bit more positive really about the net zero carbon uh, aspirations of the government and perhaps some opportunities for you, um, certainly over the ne next decade, I think it'll be really interesting for schools. Uh, my background is I'm, I'm the technical director at Briar, we're the technical engineering division of Oz Energy um, and really pleased to be here uh, to support you in any way um, with regard to any, any engineering questions, anything with regard to your building services, making your buildings work well as a school um, and, and designing good, good services and energy efficient serv services for you. The starting point um, for, this, for the guidelines is I'd like to just say that nothing I say today on, on heating and ventilating should override your risk assessments that you've done and the method statements you've, you're, you're working to on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, hopefully I'll, I'll shed some light on the heating and ventilating services. Um, I think the first thing is that the coronavirus, um, fortunately, is not airborne transmitted. Um, it's a very, very heavy virus. I think it's really important to understand that. Um, you've got a, one of the largest RNA genomes here in, in viruses um, with a protein shell and protein spikes on it that actually makes it um, relatively uninfectious in point of fact. Um, thank goodness it is. So the, the, the way in which is we, we get infected by this is by direct contact with people that have it. They may have this on their hands where they've been coughing in their hands and a direct contact like that. And also in respiratory droplets. So um, if we are singing or if we're doing exercise or panting, we're likely to put out small droplets and those will have millions of viral load in them if, if that actually is happening. So we put face masks on. Um, with regard to the the, the, the weight of this virus, I think it's important to just recognize how quickly it drops out of the atmosphere, thank goodness, to the floor. Um, I suppose you can look at this really like a, like a child jumping into a ball pit. If it jumps into a ball pit and we take the balls as being the molecules of oxygen and nitrogen at 28 and 32 molecular weight, for those chemists amongst us, um, the, the child doesn't float across the top of the balls, nor does he actually stay on top of the balls. He just disappears through these balls and hits the floor underneath the balls. That's the reality. And that's exactly what happens um, with, with, co with the COVID virus. At hundreds of thousands molecular weight, it pretty well just drops through the to the floor. I think that's good because we've got this two meter distancing. So that is, is, is certainly pretty assured that the, the virus will drop to the floor. But I think it does have implications within our schools. Um, in terms of getting this distancing is so, so hard within the school environment. Um, and I think it does have implications in that if someone is infected, this, this virus will end up on the floor. And certainly for nurseries and, and younger children where they do spend a lot of time perhaps playing on the floor, um, we, we realize that cleanliness is, is really, really important here because that's where these viruses are going to end up. In terms of what we can do about this, what we're trying to do predominantly um, is, is to space and to cover our faces, all of these various things. But with regard to the services, it's really about stopping this airborne spread or trying to stop that happening as much as possible. So preventing that high occupancy, preventing the aerosols, and with regard to the engineering services, um, making sure that we are providing enough fresh air ventilation so that if people are coughing, if people are sneezing, if these viral particles are being created in the atmosphere, then the fresh air is diluting that effect and therefore diluting the load that's being delivered into the children. So with regard to the ventilation, this is a really big issue, particularly as we go into these winter months now, not, not easy to manage whatsoever. Um, there's certainly evidence there that poorly ventilated buildings will increase um, airborne transmission. So not, not only with separation, um, the ventilation simply will dilute any viral contamination. Fresh air coming in will dilute this out, and that's important to keep these air change rates up as high as possible. Um, of course, reducing that, that exposure to the viral load will reduce the risk of actually becoming infected. So small amounts are not probably going to affect us, but large amounts in a contained environment are, are extremely dangerous. And so I suppose as schools, we need to act to maximize uh, this fresh air ventilation 
through not only your mechanical systems, if you're a modern school, you're likely to have a lot of mechanical systems, certainly city centre, um, but for, mo for the majority of schools, we're talking, unfortunately, just about straightforward natural ventilation through windows, which is not easy to manage. But let's talk about those two things uh, separately. First of all, if you've got um, air handling units and you're bringing air down from the roof through an air handling unit, it'll have recirculation and it will have a fresh air input. Normally we operate these at 90% recirculation, often 80-90% and 20%, 10% make up air, fresh air coming in. Um, the recommendations here is to go to those dampers, disconnect them and put the dampers on full fresh air operation. So you're bringing in full fresh air and recirculating nothing. This is only not to stop recirculation, there's nothing wrong with recirculation, this is predominantly just to get the fresh air in and dilute the atmosphere within your classrooms. If some of you may have uh, classrooms, lecture theatres controlled with a modern ventilation plant, these might have CO2 sensors, so the best way of doing this is these CO2 sensors increase the ventilation rate when there's high occupancy and the CO2 uh, concentration goes up in the room. We would set those set points at 400 ppm that will just open up the ventilation to full fresh air all the time. So that's a, a way to do it if you, if you have that type of complex system. Um, so it, it, it's recommended also that you operate uh, ventilation systems continuously um, or extend the operating times. This is a difficult one to make a decision on here. Um, normally a, a classroom would ventilate at about one to two air changes an hour. Um, if you've got ventilation systems, it'll be higher. You're probably up at, up at four, maybe six air changes an hour at, at, with, 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 on some ventilation systems. Um, extending the operating times um, at the end of the day is a good idea just to clear the air. But I suspect once you've ventilated for an hour or two, you've probably changed the air in the, in the classroom many times over. So leaving the ventilation systems operating all night, even on low speed, is probably entirely wasteful and actually not going to reduce the viral load whatsoever. So I think an hour or two after, after occupancy is going to clear everything with air change. Um, again, switching those ventilation systems on, which is quite normal in the winter, you switch your heating systems on early. These now would not be on research, they'd be on fresh air. So you would purge the building first thing before people come into the, the building. Again, that would be uh, recommended. Extract systems in things like washrooms, um, potentially leaving them on for longer hours is a sensible thing to do. So leaving them running would be sensible. Again, that would just draw air through the building and extract that air and uh, reduce, reduce any potential viral contamination within the building. You'll have a lot of recirculation systems within your buildings that might be fan convectors in the classrooms or in the sports halls. Um, it might be air conditioning units. It might be fan core units in your ceilings. Um, typically with your IT room, you might have a, a cassette on the ceiling or a, a, a split unit on the wall, uh, circulating air, taking in air, cooling it down and blowing it out. Um, all of these things can be kept running. There's no reason why not that these, these should be run. This, first of all, causes air movement. That air movement is, is likely just to make sure you have no stagnant spots in the room, which is recommended. Um, there are some ventilation systems, perhaps some of the IT cassettes in the ceilings where they operate at quite high velocities um, and you'll have a high, low, medium speed setting on it. Um, high velocity here would be about four meters per second. And so I do have slight concern that you might get some cross viral contamination being picked up by this blowing across if it's aggressive. You'll know if it's aggressive, you'll feel it. Um, at about four meters per second, air coming down a duct or coming out a grill, you'll start to hear the air. This isn't the motor noise, this is actually the air coming through. So, um, you know, that one of the rules of thumb we have at about four meters per second is what we try and keep design things to as they come through air handling units to stop noise. Um, so if you can hear it, you probably could probably turn the speed down. Maybe that might be a wise thing to do. Um, in terms of running these things, uh, so a lot of fan convectors won't have any fresh air. They'll just take in air at the bottom, heat it up and blow it out at the top at, at low velocities. Most fan convectors work at pretty low speeds, two meters per second, and that's no, no problem at all to run it. Um, but um, you, you, there are, so, some will have fresh air provision within them. So certainly IT uh, fan core units and things like that, you may have fresh air coming in from outside. If you've got that, then it's certainly a good idea to keep that running as much as possible. That will again, a couple of hours afterwards would, would actually dilute the air within the particular building. So there's a number of points there on your mechanical ventilation just to think about and just make sure you're acting. 
um, particularly if you've got somebody servicing your building, um, the plants on the roof, making sure they put it to full fresh air. It's important thing to, to make sure they are doing that. Um, it does take a bit of work and they may not have done that. Um, even though you may have asked for it, they may, it may not be done. So it's worth just checking that out. For those of you without, which the vast majority of schools probably haven't got a lot of mechanical ventilation. So you're, you've got a naturally ventilate, ventilated building with opening windows. Um, I think the first thing to do if you've got a modern school is just check the trickle vents. So there'll be trickle ventilation typically over the windows. Just make sure all of those are open. That provides uh, a controlled and continuous ingress of cold air. And that will be a, a, a way of doing it and controlling it in a very simple way. Um, opening of the windows, of course, you flung them open in the summer just to try and get lots of ventilation in. That's fantastic. Um, but if you open them as we get into the cold winter weather now, it's going to get harder and harder. So, um, but if you if you open windows um, by, by an inch just to crack them open, that will change the air change rate very substantially from perhaps one or two up to three to four. So you will see very far, if you can you can very quickly see that the air change rate changes if you open a window, crack it open. So um, lots of windows cracked open. Um, allowing ventilation air in is a more practical way of doing it, or indeed opening a very high level window in a hall, a high level window in a hall, opening it right up will let a lot of air out. The hot air will tend to rise and go out, bring in cold air into the building. So lots of ways to, to, to do that. Uh, recommendations are also there to purge rooms by opening the windows in breaks and lunch times. Um, not so easy to manage, of course. Um, it's probably better to have uh, some of the windows open all the time and just increase those air change rates to be safe. This is going to be a problem though as we go into the colder months. The impact on comfort um, here with mechanical ventilation, hopefully there will be heater batteries tempering the air. So in, in this instance, you, you, you may not have such a large impact on comfort, but you will increase your heating because costs quite considerably, particularly that, 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 that ventilation if you do it later into the late after trying to purge it and first thing in the morning those that cold air from outside will be heated up um, your heating will have to run longer hours your optimum start will put your heating on longer in order to get your building warm so all of these things will increase your heating consumption i'll talk about that just in a moment um, of course if you've got a naturally vented ventilated school like most um, it will cause a discomfort issue um, you know you have to change the uniform standards. Pupils will have to put on jumpers, try and keep warm as will staff. It's not, it's not easy to deal with this. Um, certainly, you know, that, that, that's the reality. Of course, there'll be that awareness issue and a tendency for people to try and close the windows, switch off the ventilation when they're getting cold. That's, that natural reaction is going to be there. Um, you'll have to work against that as well, which won't be easy. Um, I suppose in terms of dealing with this, um, I would extend the boiler operating times trying to preheat the building in the in the morning first thing before people come in is going to be even more important, uh, particularly on that Monday morning when things are, are perhaps colder. Um, I, I suppose in terms of how we feel uh, warm, about a third of that is down to the air temperature that surrounds us. And that is going to be low because of the, the ventilation we're causing through the windows. About two thirds of how we feel comfort is actually the surface temperature, the temperature of the surfaces around us. So by getting the structure, by getting the walls warmer, by preheating your building, you're likely people are going to feel more comfortable, even though the air itself is cooler. So uh, that early morning on the Monday, get it, get the school warmed up, try and warm up the fabric of the building, and that will make people feel more comfortable. Um, but at the same time, there's no easy panacea answer here. This is not going to be easy to keep people warm and comfortable through this next month or so. What's the impact of this? I think important from the management point of view and the budgeting point of view, what's the potential impact of this? Well, if we're heating a building, about half of the cost of that heating is conduction losses through the walls, the windows, um, just, just the U value, the, in other words, conducting through the elements. Um, that stays at roughly the same, so there isn't going to be too much increase there, but it is this ventilation rate, which is about just about half of the rest of the heating is this uh, ventilation to one or two air changes now typically um, we can see that doubling quite 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 straightforwardly and so if you've got hot water load in there as well we'd expect your heating cost this winter perhaps to go up by 40 percent so that's um i suppose it goes against you perhaps saved 
some heating costs and electrical costs over the uh, summer term. So unfortunately, the bad news is here that this is going to be hard to, to manage over the winter here. Uh, mechanical ventilation, obviously the pumps and fans associated with things will be running longer hours. Um, it's not a huge load like lighting is it within your school, but it is still a load. And so I'd expect that to perhaps increase your electrical costs by up to 15%. So I think it's just important just to, to, to recognize these costings that are, are there. I mean, certainly in terms of the guidance, um, the guidance is that the benefits of public health outweighs reduction in energy efficiency, of course, and therefore try to open up as much as you can and try to maintain it as comfortable as you can are, are important issues. Um, every school is a little bit different with this, as you'll appreciate, um, it's not easy. Um, and if I can be of any help from the engineering services, uh, don't hesitate to get in contact with me with regard to this. I just hope that the, the new vaccine, which we heard about yesterday, um, hack, it comes as fast as we can, and then we can perhaps uh, move on more positively than uh, trying to maintain things running, as you are doing so well at the moment. So difficult um, for everyone, and particularly for us working, um, trying to keep our, our, our children in school is, is so important to everyone. Um, let's move on to perhaps a, 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 some of the more interesting things for the future, and that is um, the net zero carbon and uh, carbon legislation and carbon opportunities. And I think there'll be a lot of opportunities over the next decade as the government pushes harder towards net zero. And we're seeing some of that happening at the moment. I'd like to just cover off perhaps three main pieces of carbon legislation first, and then look at some of the carbon opportunities. So the government is committed to achieving uh, net zero carbon by 2050. Um, and there'll, there'll be a range of initiatives, uh, legislation to try and force this across um, all walks of life and industry commerce as well. Um, and um, that's quite an ambitious target. And uh, there will be a, a lot of work on reducing the carbon intensity of our schools and also re reducing um, the improving the use of renewable energy within our schools. There's going to be lots of opportunities here. In terms of the present legislation, um, you'll be aware display energy certificates have to be created. They have to be displayed within your buildings. Um, over a thousand meters squared, this has to happen every year, um, and every uh, below a thousand meter squared building, um, once every ten years. This donate, donates really the operational efficiency, the amount of energy you consume um, per meter squared, typically uh, in different types of building. Um, it hasn't got a lot of bite at the moment. I think it will have more bite. I think there'll be more coming to try to reduce your display energy certificates and improve their performances. Um, the MIES regulations for commercial buildings indicated that they may be introducing these for, for the one and a half million commercial buildings throughout the UK. So I think we can see this operational certification and trying to improve that being quite a significant driver uh, in the future driving net zero carbon. So just be aware of that, but I don't think there's any great implication or change in the near future. Um, air conditioning inspections, TM44. I want to talk about these a bit because there's a lot, quite a lot of confusion around whether schools need them. And I want to make that clear. I do come across schools that have actually got TM44 certificates. They didn't need to do them. Um, equally, I come across schools that perhaps need them and haven't done them. So I just want to clarify that today. I think the vast majority of schools actually don't need TM44 certificates. And so that's just important just to, to, just to go through that shortly. Um, streamlined energy and carbon reporting is a requirement for uh, larger uh, multi-academy trusts or academy trusts to report their greenhouse gas emissions within their financial accounts. And I'll cover that off a little bit as well for you today. In terms of the opportunities, we're gonna talk about some of these during the week actually, but the renewable heat incentive provide you with an income if you put in a biomass boiler or low carbon heat source. Um, and that typically will repay the cost of putting that in probably a couple of times during the life of the RHI scheme. So this is, this is certainly worthwhile if you're thinking about biomass boilers or anything like that. So a real opportunity there it has been around for a while but continues to be worthwhile. If you've got a, a swimming pool, um, combined heat and power, which is an engine set, usually driven on natural gas um, that can generate electricity and also heat is, is probably more practical than it's ever been in the last 40 years. Um, I've looked at this for, for many, many occasions. Um, the payback periods are very, very fast, typically about three years. So if those of you who've got swimming pools, what we do is, is the, the situation here is electricity prices have gone up so high with the government levies. 
you'll typically be paying 15 pence or a lot more for electricity. At the same time, you'll be paying relatively low cost for natural gas, perhaps three pence per kilowatt hour. It varies from size of school and location. What we do is we generate electricity with the natural gas and we can generate that at about 10 pence per kilowatt hour. So about a, a third saving on electricity prices at the moment. In addition to that, of course, you get all of the heat off the unit to heat your swimming pool and the ventilation. So um, a really sensible thing, if you've got a wet pool, some of you will have swimming pools, it, it might be worth thinking about combined heat and power at the moment, very, very worthwhile. And certainly private sector funding is there available to, to do this uh, without a doubt. Um, Richie Sunak announced a billion pounds for the public sector decarbonisation, heat decarbonisation programme. That was launched about a month ago. We're working with many maths to try and look at the um, uptake on this and see how, how we can make the best of that. Um, in fact, we've got a presentation on this uh, tomorrow morning, so I'd be happy to give you some updates on that. Um, this is an opportunity. It's not a panacea at all. Um, it's not that easy, but um, certainly worth knowing about, and certainly there will be more uh, finances coming down this type of route in the future. So I think everybody should be aware of that, and it can make quite a big difference if we want to upgrade our building structures, put on renewables, and upgrade the heating system. So those are some of the key areas um, that are really interesting at the moment. Let's talk about um, one or two of the carbon compliance issues. Um, streamlined Energy and Carbon Reporting has unfortunately captured a lot of multi-academy trusts that are reporting their company accounts. So this applies to all organisations that are registering company accounts. So unfortunately, as public sector organisations, you shouldn't have been captured. But as, as an organisation that um, submits company accounts, you are captured by this legislation, unfortunately. So if your MAT meets two of the following criteria, you need to report in your company accounts um, on your streamlined energy and carbon. Um, 250 employees, a turnover greater than 36 million across the consolidated group, and a balance or a balance sheet value of greater than 18 million. And as energy had a look at this, we looked at this a little while ago to pull facts and figures together on this. Um, there's over one and a half thousand mats in the UK, representing over 7,000 academy schools. About a third of those mats are captured by this. So any large mat with, with a number of academies will start to get captured. Um, representing about 66% of academy schools that are in mats are, are actually coming into this. Um, the usual qualification is obviously the employees that very quickly get captured. 250 employees is you know you only need a few schools because um, part-time staff are captured within this as well. And then the balance sheet value tends to capture people. The value of your schools, your, the property assets are quite high, and the balance sheet value is all your property assets, including all your liquid assets at the moment as well. So it's a sum of the assets. It's not the balance sheet value at the end. It's the sum of all of your assets. So it's very easily get captured. Obviously, larger mats will also get captured on the turnover, but the majority, first of all, get captured on those first two uh, criteria. What do you have to do with streamlined energy and carbon reporting? It is a report of your gas and electricity consumption within your buildings every single year, and that goes into your director's report of your accounts. Um, it also includes your transport fuels, which is minibuses that you might be running. If it's an outsourced contract and somebody's running your minibuses or your coaches, that's absolutely fine. That's not your footprint. It has to be you paying the fuel bills yourself. So um, it, 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 it's a, that's a bit easier. Um, also, Grey Fleet, if you are paying a pence per mile to staff that are um, attending other schools or attending conferences, etc., then that also gets captured. That's that you're paying for that fuel through the pence per mile to the staff private cars. So that also gets captured. If you've got renewables on your roof, if you've got PV solar or anything, we have to bring that into that gross footprint as well. So we, you need a gross and a net footprint, gross being your total energy consumption. Um, from your buildings and your net being perhaps minus your your renewable energy generation on your roof for example this is all then converted to tons of carbon dioxide uh, per annum um, you compare this year with last year's which is relatively simple to do in future in future you don't have to do it for the first set of accounts um, you have to look at your energy intensity ratio and we're looking to try and improve that over the years and the that's for schools it's always tons of carbon dioxide per pupil uh, using your autumn census, very straightforward to do. 
you have to say what you've done in terms of energy efficiency over this particular year um, and make a little narrative up there and, and, and put down your methodology for doing this. So relatively simple report really, but there's a lot number of things to be thought about. And particularly when you've got a large number of schools within your mat, that data collection and getting that data collection robust every year is, is really, really important. The requirement for here is to actually produce this um, really for November. So it's your, your year ended in August. So you need to be producing this for November 20. So you should be doing that now. And I think the majority of you are, and we're working with a number of you to do, help you with that. Just finally, uh, TM44 air conditioning inspections. Um, they're required if you've got 12 kilowatts of cooling within your building. So, but it's in within one building alone. So if you've got 12 on your, on your whole school, that's not what we're saying. We're talking about 12 kilowatts in a single separate building. So people get caught up and add up the whole school. That's not correct. It's per building, so separate buildings. Also, you don't include your data room air conditioning, which is process. So this is comfort cooling. The, 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 the cooling systems to your kitchen, your IT rooms are typically the ones we're looking at here. So please don't um, get captured and add, add in too many because you'll be, you'll be doing a, 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 a TM44 inspection when you don't need to do it. What you need to do is go outside, look at your compressor condenser units outside. There's a typical example. And on it, you're looking at the cooling capacity in kilowatts. This is the kilowatts cooling capacity. You can see it circled there, squared off there in red, and that's 14 kilowatts. And that unit would actually bring you into this. So you're totaling those up per building. And if you're over 12 kilowatts in a building, then you will need to do a TM44 inspection. Relatively simple. Um, Accredited engineer, we have a number here. So we would come along and do a survey for you, report it through accredited software and then register it and it's then registered for five years. But I think the vast majority of schools would not be captured by this legislation. If you've got any concerns about it, please don't hesitate to contact us and it will improve energy efficiency. There are some cost savings from this. If you have a lot of air conditioning, it's certainly worth doing. That wraps things up for me. Um, so there's my contact details. By all means, um, get in touch if you have any questions.